What up? What up? What up? What up? Alright, what's up? Middle of the day stream. We're not used to this. But that's okay. You're going to get used to it. Because... It's just how it is. It is what we be it and we do what we is. We is what we be. We do what we be and we is what we is. You know what I'm saying? Y'all y'all know if y'all feel me, right? You feel me? Y'all feel me? Look, we did these other ones and everybody loved it. And I was reading back through the comments on these uh, debate reviews that we did. And there was a lot of love. I want a whole lot of love. And a whole lot of love. So we got a whole lot of love on these other <clears throat> debate reviews. So I thought, why not step it up, do another one? We've had a lot of requests. And I was looking the other day for debates. And I was like, man, there's just not, there's not anymore. I don't, I couldn't find it. And then I forgot that this one has like three parts to it. And I was like, oh yeah, I never did the second part. So I found the second part. <clears throat> I watched a little bit of it to see what they talk about because I didn't know where, where they go in the second part. And I saw that it gets into some pretty interesting stuff with human sacrifice. And they've got 
over 2 million views on it. So I thought, let's do some analysis of this one. Let's review the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, God, Atheism, Bible, Jesus 2. And uh, I heard the first hour. So I know a little bit of where they go. Uh, I, I was listening off and on. I was doing some other things. But I heard enough to know that it's interesting and it's worth our perusal. So let's get into it. This is the second of their conversations with uh, Brett Weinstein present as the sort of moderator. And it's interesting to, to go back and watch this now. In, that This was like five years ago. Because uh, both of these people have uh, garnered quite a bit of criticism. Hey, Jamie, yeah. could you bring me that gallon of water? Okay. I'm going to have to have a sipping jug to talk about all the nonsense in this debate. <clears throat> They've garnered a lot of criticism, uh, both of them. Sam Harris for his ridiculous takes on Russia hoax, coof, stabbies, being wrong on so many things, calling for weird things like eating, I don't remember what he was saying, eating people or don't, I don't remember what, he'd rather eat kids than doubt Fauci. I don't know, some nonsense he said. I, I don't keep up with these people, so who knows what they say. But he's kind of embarrassed himself, I guess, in regard to a bunch of uh, public guffaws and um, foot-in-mouth scenarios. And um, not surprising, because we've seen in our previous reviews of Sam Harris that we didn't find the strongest logical and philosophical argumentation. Now, I, I did look up, and I think he does have a degree. So at first I was like, was he just a public commentator who just says that he's a philosophy man? But I think he does have an undergraduate, if I remember. But we saw a lot of uh, a bizarre uh, comments, contradictions, and also in the other reviews that we did, I did get one point wrong. Because I'm not a huge Sam Harris follower, so I didn't <clears throat> I didn't realize that uh, it is true that he has critiqued Islam a lot. Islam a lot of like him, right? And he's critiqued it <clears throat> because he sees it as sort of all of the religions are kind of the same and they're all kind of radical and crazy and fringe. And uh, if I remember correctly, I didn't think that he had. So that was one mistake that I made in the comment in the debate reviews that we did in the past. But as you know, what we what we like to do is just kind of riff on the debates as they as they pop up as they happen. And so I don't typically know what where they're going with their arguments. So, but I don't mind being wrong about stuff. I got something else wrong uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, that's a dad joke, right? I got something wrong the other day, um, and you know. Sometimes that happens in life where you get something wrong. Now, what's the dad joke? I forget how it goes. I got something wrong. Uh, ask me next year and see if we got it. I, I don't know. Some dumb dad joke, right? If you would hit like and share. Let's get into it. No dad jokes allowed. Only dirty jokes allowed with Sam Harris and uh, your boy Jordan Peterson. Who we have delved pretty deeply into his lectures. As you know, we're about eight or nine lectures deep into him. I got about five lectures deep into Verveki before we did the Verveki stream with Kotel. So I'm getting a, a much better sense and feel for these people over the last couple of years because I just never paid any attention to the. What did the New York Times dub this pseudo sphere, the, the intellectual dark web? <laughs> I mean, and, but then it's, I guess there's still millions of people that believe that this is some sort of like highly intellectual discourse that it's just, I don't know. I mean, I think some people, it looks, seems like a lot of the kerfluffle lately is people are starting to see through some of this uh, intellectual dark web stuff. But anyway, let's hear Sam Harris's opening statement about um, ethics and human sacrifice or something. I don't remember where he goes with this, but let's see what he says. Let's, let's analyze, react, riff, and review. Conversations right. about the origins of these, of, of, of certain of these stories. 
But at minimum, my criticism of religion, because it tends to focus on the, the most obvious case of, of a zero-sum contest between religious dogmatism and you know, scientific open-ended discussion, uh, is, doesn't address this core issue of the significance of, of religious thinking and religious narrative because I am, for the most part, just shooting fish in, in a barrel, criticizing fundamentalists, uh, and the kind of God that the fundamentalists believe in, the God who's an invisible person who hates homosexuals, obviously that's not the, 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 deep, the deepest version of these religious, this, this, this essentially what is a narrative technology for orienting human life in the cosmos. So maybe I'll leave it there, but that's, I think, what Jordan thinks. Okay. All right, uh, Jordan. Woo! Woo! Yeah! Dunkin' on the fundamentalists. Dunkin' on the backwoods Ozark snake handling preachers, of which there might be five in America. So he's... He even said he's shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> it's like he's dunking on uh, fundies. I mean, like that's some kind. Of, that's like me going on TikTok and dunking on the eighteen-year-old atheist girls, which I should do more of, which is pretty fun, right? That's like Matt Dillahunty the other night. Remember we played that clip of him dunking on that Karen mom calling in. Oh, owning the moms. Oh, Matt Dillahunty putting them single moms in their place. It's called low-hanging fruit, right? That's like Ben Shapiro going to the college campus and debating the, uh, you know, the women's studies. Oh, owned them, dude. Oh, that's low-hanging fruit, bro. Anyway, and what did he say in this opening statement that was so profound? This audience is funny, by the way. Like, if you... <laughs> I was listening, doing some other things to this first half of this thing. And the audience, like, they clap at, like, everything. And I'm thinking, is there a, an applause light going off above them telling the audience, like, it's a dang sitcom, like a Seinfeld or something, telling them to laugh, the applause? It's like, it doesn't feel authentic. It's like every time, yeah, 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 he just stated, he just stated his position, yeah, oh. Before you steel man Sam's point, how did you feel about his encapsulation? Of <coughs> well, I, I'm convinced, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, a lot, I mean, uh, well, I got a, a couple of things to say about it. It's like There's a also a bunch of jokes <clears throat> in this discussion that I'm also not understanding. Maybe I've, I thought I'd have an okay sense of humor. But maybe I got Spurgery 5000 and I don't get humor because a lot of the jokes in this, I'm just like, is, the, is, there, a, is there a laughter button going off too above the audience for, the, for these dad jokes? First of all, I think it was uh, accurate, concise, fair. Um, I also think that, this is a more technical note in some sense, is that if, if you ever want to think about something, that's exactly what you have to do. Right? You want to take arguments that are against your perspective and you want to make them as strong as you possibly can so that you can force... So they're just talking about steel manning arguments. Okay, that's fine. But, I mean, Sam Harris just basically said <clears throat> religion can't work because it doesn't function to actually give us knowledge and truths. It's just these old, obscure uh, stories, right? So that's basically what he was saying. Fortify your arguments against them. You don't want to make them weak because that just makes you weak. And so, you know, Sam and I are both scientists, and it really is the case that what scientists are trying to do, and I think what we're actually trying to do in this conversation, genuinely, is to try to find out if there's something that we're thinking that's stupid. You know, because uh, when, when I'm laying out the arguments that Sam just summarized so well, I've tried to generate a bunch of opposition to them in my own imagination, and the arguments I put forward are ones I can't undermine, but that doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean that at all. And so if someone comes along, who's, and this is certainly the case if you're a scientist who's worth his or her salt, if someone comes along and says, hey, look, you've made a mistake in this fundamental proposition, it's like, yes, great, that means I can make progress towards a more solid theory of being. So 
And that's what we're trying to do. And I do think it's worth Wait a minute. To make progress towards a more solid theory of being. We're scientists. I'm a scientist. Sam is a scientist. And we want to make progress towards a more fundamental theory of being. Being is the domain of philosophy and metaphysics, which Jordan Peterson explicitly does not want to go into, as we learn in his lectures. Um, he often makes appeal to philosophical, metaphysical topics and, and, and you know, claims about existence, claims about ontology, which is the domain of metaphysics. But now he's saying, no, we don't. If you watch his lectures, he's like, I, I do psychology, I don't do metaphysics. As he makes all these metaphysical claims, and the project, I think, as we've learned from a lot of the, the deeper Petersonian uh, esotericists that we've talked to, the project is to try to do metaphysics without doing metaphysics. And uh, I just don't get w what the advantage of this is. Like, they, they think that pragmatically it'll be more acceptable to a modern audience if we don't go into philosophy as we use a bunch of philosophy. We're going to sneak it in. But no, scientists are not interested in theories of being. Scientists do not care about being and metaphysics. At least modern so-called scientists, right? Scientism. And I mean, he's got one of the foremost proponents of scientism on the stage. Uh, so it would have been nice to have a distinction between science and scientism, but. And so I thought that was just fine, exactly dead on. And I hope I can do justice to your position as well. Yeah. So, okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to summarize Sam's argument briefly. Their volume is up all the way. Let, let, let you guys know why he thinks I'm, things, what things I'm not taking into account. So, <clears throat> Sam believes that there are two fundamental dangers to psychological and social stability. Um, religious fundamentalism, essentially on the right, and moral relativism and nihilism on the left. And so, the danger of the right wing position is that it enables people to arbitrarily establish certain revealed axioms as indisputable truth and then to tyrannize that's a great point there uh, vegetable as be vegetal asbestos um typically sam harris as a representative of most most atheists mistakes stating his position with an argument and so that's typically what he does is just state his position. And then that's taken to be, you see Matt Delaney does the same thing too. He does it all the time where he, he says, I don't find it convincing, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, but none of that was an argument. That's a psychological report, uh, not an argument. ...themselves and other people with the claims that those are divine revelations. And he sees that as part of the danger of religious fundamentalism and maybe religious thinking in general, but also is something that characterizes secular totalitarian states that also has a religious aspect. So that's on the right. And then on the left, well, the problem with the, with the moral relativism nihilism position is that it leaves us with no orientation. And it also flies in the face of common sense observations that there are ways to live that are bad and that there are ways to live that are good that people can generally agree on. And that statements about those general agreements about how to live can be considered factual. Now, so, and, and then the next part of Sam's argument is that we require a value system that allows us to escape these twin dangers. One stultifies us and the other leaves us hopeless, let's say. And that value system has to be grounded in something real. And the only thing that he can see that... Well, again, now Peterson's appealing to metaphysics by something, quote, real. You know, that's the domain of metaphysics and you can't escape metaphysics by saying that I don't care about metaphysics, right? When you say something is this or is matter, is is a predicate of identity. <clears throat> the only thing that exists is matter, okay? That is a materialist metaphysical statement or claim. So you cannot actually avoid metaphysics and <clears throat> we're going to see this in a minute <clears throat> when it gets very uh, clear that the ethics they begin to discuss, which by the way is false, what, the, what they discuss is actually not true, but <clears throat> the whole debate <clears throat> at this point becomes predicated on <clears throat> whether the Bible teaches human sacrifice, which is, doesn't, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so, so the true and the good, and this is how I'm going to start presenting tag, because I think it's a lot easier. 
versus the false and the bad. Okay, now keep this in mind because this is going to be kind of our model for how we try to make tag a little more accessible, right? So remember the true and the good, these two categories relate to one another and then the false and the bad, right? The true to the false, the good to the bad. These are value judgments that are at once ethical and metaphysical. So keep that in mind. And likewise, we could also say that they entail a degree of uh, epistemology too, because to say that you know what is true versus what is false is a knowledge claim. To say that we should follow what is true versus what is false is a value claim that is in the is ought domain, right? Or is in the ought domain. To say that something is a value that we should shoot for is to say that it is a good versus something that we should avoid, which is the bad. So you'll notice that this simple little four part chart here is going to help us to understand tag in a very easy way. And it turns out that it will be very accessible in this debate it actually constitutes real in any provable sense and there, there's a certain amount of historical and conceptual weight behind this claim is the domain of empirical facts as as they've been manifested in the sciences and technologies that have made us incredibly powerful and increasingly able to flourish in the world and so we need to ground our value propositions in something that we've been able to determine has genuine solidity to so that we can so that we can orient our value values, propositions, we can moral claims value propositions, dangerous. moral claims. We can begin with some basic facts that we can identify, as I mentioned brie briefly, what constitutes a bad life, endless pain, suffering, anxiety, tremendous amount of negative emotion, short-term lifespan, all the things that no one would choose voluntarily for themselves if, if we would all agree that they were thinking in a, in a healthy manner. And we can contrast that sort of domain of horror with the good life, which might involve, well, certainly freedom from privation and want and undue threat and anxiety and hope for the future and all of that. Right, so the actual original video has very low audio. Everything I have on my end is cranked all the way up to the max. So if you go and listen to this actual discussion, you'll have to turn everything up because it's, it's really low in the original. And that we can agree that those are <coughs> poles, good, bad and good, and that that's a factual claim. So he, Sam also claims that we can define the good life, this is an extension of it, with re reference to flourishing and well-being and that, that that can actually be measured and that we should and can inform the idea of flourishing and well-being with empirical data. Having said all that, he also leaves uh, a, 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 what would you, a domain of inquiry open that would be centered on the possibility that some of the ideas that have been encapsulated in religious phenomenology, if not in religious dogma, might be worth pursuing as well, that there might be wisdom that could practically be applied in terms of perception to, to spiritual practices, although those become danger when dangerous, increasingly dangerous as they become ensconced in dogma. And so that's Sam's position. And then his criticism of my ideas, um, he, he would say that it's facts, not stories, that constitute the ground for the proper science of well-being, uh, and that we don't need to be connected to stories, ancient stories in particular, to thrive. And the reason for that are that these ancient stories are pathological in certain details, especially in the specific claims they make, uh, which, which look outrageous in some sense from a modern moral perspective. Um, and he believes that it's... So this is the next point I want to mention here because this comes up um, a couple times as we progress through this discussion. And it's the idea that we don't need uh, stories, we just need facts. But, and this is what Sam Harris has never grasped, or if he's grasped it, he's been uh, willfully ignorant or bad-willed. And that's the idea that, <clears throat> that facts themselves can give you some kind of meaning or value. And this is what we talk about when we talk about the is-ought distinction, right? Stating what is the case can never give you a logically conclusive decision about what ought to be the case. So if I'm just a bunch of molecules bouncing around, you're a bunch of molecules, we're all just meat sacks. There's nothing about meat sacks which says they ought to be this way versus that way. They just are, right? And so you can never, this goes back to David Hume, you can never get a universal ought claim out of states of affairs 
for just existing matter, right? Just think about, I don't know, let's, let's think about uh, we blend up a bunch of garbage juice in a blender and we make a garbage juice smoothie, right? And we say that it has, I don't know, 5 billion molecules now. Does it make sense to say, no, but it ought to have had 4 billion molecules. It would have been better if the garbage juice had had 4 billion molecules than 5. It makes no sense, right? So just think of everything, everything being reduced to matter. <clears throat> and then arbitrarily saying that, oh no, you see there should have been 5 zillion molecules in the universe, not 5 quatillion molecules. It, just, it doesn't make any sense. There's no ought there. And if there's no ought, by the way, there's also no true and false, you see. <clears throat> because these relate to one, one to another, right? If there's no good or bad, then there's also not true and false. There's just what is. And waving to ignore those specific topics with, with a, you know, with a, what would you call it, an optimistic overview of the entire context um, that, that they're they're dangerously outdated now if they ever were useful um, that there are some interpretations for any modern usage to be reliably derived and so he believes that attempts to interpret these stories let's say so Sam's argument was that <clears throat> because a lot of people disagree on religion it can't function as any kind of reliable uh, guide, as if facts aren't interpreted and they just simply are, right? This is a very ridiculous, naive view of philosophy that that in philosophy or in epistemology, something about a fact makes it self-evident or makes it obvious or makes it somehow clear, whereas other things like texts or stories require interpretation. No, I'm sorry, facts require interpretation just as much as a story does. Because essentially everything that exists is in some way iconographic, right? This is this is why you have to study philosophy, or else you're going to be plagued by all of these dumb presuppositions, right? Such as the idea that number one that there are quote brute facts. There's no brute facts. Even if there were, then <clears throat> what would distinguish a brute fact from another brute fact? Wouldn't everything just be simply a brute fact? Because everything, by the way, in this worldview is reduced to pure matter. So <clears throat> the Harris position is, again, just riddled with a lot of um, naive assumptions about how epistemology and ethics and philosophy of science works, right? Sam Harris would do well to take a philosophy of science class because he would learn that some of the basic questions that arise are things like assuming that just looking through a microscope somehow makes that more... Uh, a clearer presentation than some some other kind of evidence. Now maybe it does, but the assertion doesn't make it so. Right? Just saying that. Well, we all know that science is, uh, you know, self-evident. It's clear. It's brute facts. That doesn't mean that it is so. In fact, again, if he was aware of the whole domain of philosophy of science, there's a tremendous amount of debate on that very question. What about the underdetermination of data thesis, right? Which is, let's say I have a, t a ton of data and I have two rival mutually exclusive paradigms that the data fits equally into. Just having a lot of data isn't going to tell me which of the two paradigms the data fits into correctly. And all of these uh, enlightenment assumptions that Sam Harris has, again, are just really operating on ignorance of a lot of modern epistemology and philosophy. That's why, by the way, I think... Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Tyson, T Neil deGrasse McTyson says, don't study philosophy. It's a waste of time. Yeah, because they want you inducted into the scientism cult, which is just another religion. Um, are rife with so many potential errors of bias and interpretation and subjectivity that all the interpretations in some sense are unreliable um, and perhaps equally unreliable. That they're da that worse than that, not only are they unreliable, but they're dangerous insofar as the claims they lay out are pose a threat to scientific and enlightenment values, which are the true savers of humanity as evidence <laughs> of our progress, let's say, over the last two or three hundred years. So I don't know if this is Jordan's position or if he's stating Sam's position because 
you heard it right there. What's the salvation? What's our salvation? Classical liberal enlightenment values. And this is where you're never going to get anybody in either of these boomer categories, whether Harris or Peterson, to question classical liberalism. Of course, classical liberalism has absolutely nothing to do with, for example, Orthodox Christianity. They are antithetical in their structure, right? And yet, what did you just hear? Classical liberalism and the Enlightenment are the salvation of the human race, at least for the past couple hundred years. And that they're also susceptible to the totalitarian interpretation, which I described earlier, which confer upon the interpreter a sense of and then a claim to reveal truth. And so I would say... By the way, I mean, not everything in the Enlightenment was uh, classically liberal. Uh, I mean, there's enlightenment, I and mean, you could argue classical liberal enlightenment atheism led to the worst unleashing of atheistic murder and tyranny ever with the rise of Bolshevism, Maoism, Communism, Stalinism, tiny mustache manism, all of it, right, led to millions and millions of democide. But, oh no, it's the classical liberal values that we have to prop up, right? But nobody will ever question the classical liberal values. Nobody will ever. That's because we're always given a controlled circle about what you're allowed to talk about. And nobody gets propelled to the highest heights of fame and stardom who doesn't operate within the circle of what you can and can't talk about. That's Sam's argument and his, and his criticisms of my position. So... <clears throat> Okay, and so you, you, you write my next book. I'll write yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Sam, how do you feel about that characterization of your position? Uh, certainly close enough to get the conversation started. I mean, there's a few, the grounding stuff we, ha we have yet to talk about, and I'm not as, I'm not as much a stickler for materialistic scientific empiricism as I heard implied there, but we can, we can come okay, to that. Well, okay, that, okay, so hold, yep, hold on. Yep, yep. I think from the point of view of the yep. audience, this is, a, this is a good barometer of where we got to last night, and I think actually the gains are really impressive, which I have to say is spooking me because of something called regression to the mean. Now, if I catch either one of you regressing to the mean tonight, I will hunt you down and I will ridicule you on Twitter tomorrow. So. <laughs> You have been warned. Okay. Um, all right. So, do either one of you want to now uh, talk about what was missing from the other characterization? Has left them true in some sense other than a purely literal one. And so, religions would then, according to actually what you heard from uh, both Sam and Jordan, uh, religions would fall into this class of things. These are encapsulations of uh, stories and prescriptions that if you follow them, irrespective of whether they literally describe the universe, you end up with certain advantages that you, you may not know why they are there, but nonetheless, you, you are ahead of your, uh, you're, you're ahead of your position if you were to navigate just simply on your, your perceptions. So right. that's the concept. Yeah. yeah, so I think there's a good analogy that, that you and I stumbled onto after we did a podcast together. You had a, an analogy about a porcupine that could shoot its quills, which many people balked at, but a, a listener got, gave us a better one, which was the idea that uh, anyone who's worked with guns at, at all must have heard this admonishment to treat every gun as if it is loaded, right? And you actually, when I, last night when I uh, alleged that you believed in God, you corrected. No, notice what he says here, right? So this is the Jordan Peterson does not believe in God. He lives as if God exists, right? Which, I mean, may, this is five years ago. Maybe he's changed his position. I don't know. But that uh, anyone who's worked with guns at all must have heard this admonishment to treat every gun as if it is loaded, right? And you actually, when I last night when I uh, alleged that you believed in God, you corrected me. You said no. You live as if God exists, right? And so this, this seems like a there's a, uh, a connection here. So. If, you're, if, you know, if I had a gun here that I wanted to show Brett, if I know anything about guns, I'm going to make damn sure that it's unloaded, right? I'm going to pull back the slide, I'm going to drop the magazine, pull back the slide, check the chamber, and do this in a redundant fashion that, that really looks like I'm suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, it, it is truly redundant. 
uh, and then I'll hand it to Brett, and if Brett knows anything about guns, he will do the same thing having just seen me do it. And if he hands it back to me again, I will do the same thing even though there, there may be no ammunition around. around. Right? right, so, so it, it really is. I mean, does this is this what they think gun safety is? <laughs> like, so like each person has to check the chamber to make sure that there's not a bullet in it. Bullet because if you because bullets just go off, right? This is how people treat it. Like because I guess everybody's into guns now in the last I don't know five or ten years, whatever. I mean that's a good thing that people are into guns, I guess. But I mean this, this is like the city liberals' idea of gun safety, which is that. Each successive person who's already checked and shown everybody that it's empty and there's no, not even a magazine in it, you still, you still have to keep checking the chamber. It's like, like people make fun of uh, the boomers for trigger discipline, right? Oh, don't have your finger on the trigger unless you're ready to shoot. This is like the next level of it, which is like the, the, the atheist, the the city atheist metropolitan soy man's gun safety tips of every single person has to constantly check the chamber to make even if the first person just already did it like you also have to do it and then when you hand it back to the first guy he also has to do it because you might have snuck a bullet in the chamber even if there's no magazine in there i mean it's just like this is this is this part was comedic right here and i'm like and what does what does porcupines that shoot quills and guns how what are we what does this have to do with this debate? I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I want to hear the analogy here. This part's getting comedic. Crazy at the level of our explicit knowledge of the situation, and yet absolutely necessary to do. And it's, it's not merely, it's, it, it, it runs very deep. I mean, I would, it, it, that whole time you, you're careful not to point the barrel of the gun at anything you would be afraid to shoot. Uh, and when people fail to live this way around guns, they, with some unnerving frequency, actually shoot themselves or people close to them by accident. Uh, so it is really the only proper hedge against just the, 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 the odds of being in proximity to, to uh, loaded weapons. And yet, if someone in the middle of this operation came up to us and said, you know, actually there's a casino that just opened across the street that will take your bets about whether or not guns are loaded. Would you like to bet a million dollars as to whether or not this gun is loaded? Well, of course, I would bet those million dollars every time that it's not loaded because I know it's not loaded. So there's, there's, a, there's a literal truth and a, a, a metaphorical truth. Where, you know, <laughs> this, uh, atheists really love those uh, extrapolated uh, stories. Remember JF debate? Imagine there is a planet where there is no people, but there is a robot brain, and it's like it's like uh, fantasy worlds, right? This atheists love fantasy worlds. They love these <clears throat> outlandish examples. I, what was this example? Imagine there's a gun with no bullets, but you can take it to, and we've all inspected it like multiple times obsessively to make sure there's no bullets in it. And we take it to the casino that gives you a million dollars to bet on there not being bullets in the gun. <laughs> I mean, is this supposed to be a fundamentalist religion is like the, the, the bullet that may or may not have the, the gun that may or may not have bullets. I, this is, I'm lost in this fanciful fan fiction, atheist fan Otherwise fiction here. It's a, a very useful fiction which in this case is actually more useful. I don't actually think it was very useful. I thought it was more obscurant than anything else that we've heard so far. So it was actually less useful and ridiculous. But I'm enjoying that it's these creative fantasy rides. I feel like I'm reading Heavy Metal Magazine or something with Sam Harris. Than the truth, right? But the only way I can understand its utility is... Heavy Metal Magazine is a cartoon of a bunch of, like fantasy fiction stories, by the way, for those that don't know. It's not Metal Magazine. And, and even utter the phrase metaphorical truth in a way that's comprehensible is in the context of distinguishing it from literal truth. And, so, and, yeah. Go ahead. This, this, is yeah, this is the dumbest analogy this, this I've like ever heard in my life that trailed off into absolutely total nonsense. So we've all checked the gun multiple times. We've got our Luger... Uh, I've obsessively handed it to Brett Weinstein so that he could check the chamber, even though the magazine is out of it. And then when he hands it back to me, I also have to check the chamber because even though there's no magazine or clip in it, there might still be a bullet in there, which we just checked. Both of us was not there. I also then, but we can take it to the casino 
where Tony Soprano will give you a million dollars if you bet on whether there's a, I mean, and this was his, this was his, it made no sense, dude. What? Next space. I'm, I'm a little, I'm worried by how excited you are. But, no, no. <laughs> well, so, I mean, so I have a, uh, story laughter, laughter light going off, laughter light. You could tell me what, what Applause you light. Okay, think about this. Okay, so, so, one of the things that I've been reconsidering since we talked last night is, is the nature of our dispute about the relationship between facts and values. Because I, I think I can make a case that what I've been trying... This is the is odd question, for those that don't know. This is the Sam Harris, Harris can never deal with this, because, either because he doesn't understand it or because he's willfully uh, unwilling to admit that this is a major problem for his ridiculous worldview to do especially in my first book was to ground values in facts but i'm not doing it the same way that you are exactly so so i, I don't want to make that a point point of contention so and i'll get to that in a moment but with regards to this again people that have studied philosophy which is very few of us and i'm not trying to be an arrogant douche but like this is so, operating at such a low tier it's just sad that everybody thinks that this is this is what public intellectual discourse is is this really like low tier psychology type discussions of brute facts and values. I mean, I mean, if you'd have one or two philosophy classes or epistemology classes, you would know that there's nothing. I mean, when you just call something a fact, right, to get Petersonian here, what does that mean? Just calling something a fact or saying these things are the are the facts. Right, facts and logic, facts and logic, doesn't make them that. It doesn't give an account for how that's a fact versus things that are not facts. So you need more than just saying that and, and asserting that, and giving. You need to be able to give an account for it. But I, I don't think these people. We saw one discussion which we covered, I think, about a year ago, between Peterson and Harris on the Peterson podcast, where they actually drilled into brute facts and. To Peterson's credit, he did ask him, what do you think a brute fact is, right? And he didn't give an answer, right? So, I mean, but this is what this is what we're stuck with. This is what millions of people watch thinking that this is like high-level intellectual discourse. And it's like, it's hard. It's like, it's what you would get in the discussion they're having is, is the discussion that I had like the first or second day of my undergrad philosophy of science class. So there you go. Metaphorical truth. Let, let me tell you something. You, you tell me what you think about this. So one of the things that's been observed by anthropologists worldwide is that human beings tend to make sacrifices. So I'm going to spend two minutes, three minutes, laying out a sacrificial story. And the reason I want to do it is because, see, what I think happened with regards to the origin of these profound stories is that people first started to, to behave, behave in certain, certain ways. That yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is the bullet belief in God? I'm thinking maybe that's what it was. Or no, the gun is belief in God, right? But I don't know. I mean, I, the fan fiction, atheist fan fiction story there, I just lost. I don't, I don't know what he was trying to say with that. Had uh, survival significance. And that was selected for as, as a consequence of... of, of, of of the, the standard selection practices. And so that was instantiated in behavior. And then because we could observe ourselves, because we're self-conscious creatures, that we started to make representations of those patterns and dramatize them and then encapsulate them in stories. So it's a bottom up from, from so it would be sort of like ch chimpanzees or wolves become aware of their dominance hierarchy structures and the strategies that they use. So a wolf, for example, mm -hmm. if two wolves are having a dominance dispute, one, the wolf. So notice that you're only allowed to have this discussion at the public sphere within the domain of Darwinian evolution, right? Nobody who ever questioned any of that, and there are plenty of academics that do, would be even allowed in this discussion. And this is part of the control of the circle, the circle of acceptable discourse, right? Where you're not allowed to interject or bring in topics that don't fit within the acceptable circle. But the acceptable circle is really just a means of control. And it's, this is the kind of stuff that Tavistock came up with. I mean, quite literally, they, they figured out at Tavistock, uh, Lewin, Trist, all these different characters, Rees, they drew up a way to 
control public social discourse by having an, an acceptable cir circle. And the reason it's a control mechanism is that anything outside the circle is not even considered a viable, allowable, or uh, it, it's not tab. It's taboo if you ask a question outside the circle. So these two people have a purely humanistic account of religion. Uh, Peterson is giving his argument that we adapted through evolutionary process the ability to um, see patterns, and that gave us structure and meaning. And so structure and meaning are really these humanly created categories. He thinks they're real, but he also seems to only think that they're conceptual, right? So they're not ontologically existing things. And that's why he's basically a Kantian. He doesn't think you can know anything in itself. But you can talk about these abstract and conceptual categories of psychology or the mind. They're structures in the mind. That's the Kantian type of view. And we're going to just forget about the questions of whether teleology or purpose actually exists in the external world, whether these structures are actually things in the external world. We're going to confine it to the human social domain. And so, but it also sounds like, and he's at least a little unclear at times because sometimes he sounds like he believes that he's a, that it's social constructivism, right? That these categories or values in Peterson's idea are social constructs that are adaptation, evolutionary adaptations. And then other times he sounds like he believes they're real metaphysical things, but he might also believe they're real metaphysical adaptations that are only in the mind and not actually existing things. But that's why it's a lot of sleight of hand because the whole discourse here is avoiding the real questions, the real issues and to, um, dumbed down low IQ Western audiences. I mean, they're just dazzled by this conversation as if it's just the height of IQ. And it's like somebody else said, it's like, this is what a dumb person thinks is intellectual discourse, right? This, this, this conversation is what dumb people think is high IQ. I think that's a, the best, the best way to put it. That gives up first, lays down and puts his neck open so the other wolf can tear it out. And then the other wolf doesn't. And you could say, well, it's as if a wolf is following a rule about not killing a weaker member of the pack. Of course, wolves don't have rules. They have behavioral patterns. But a self-conscious wolf would watch what the wolves were doing and then say, well, it's as if we're acting out the idea that each wolf in the pack has intrinsic value. And then that starts to be, and maybe the wolves would have a little story, story about that. Oh! forbearing wolf that doesn't tear out the neck of its opponents and that that's a good wolf well that's good wolf ethics and, right. and and so but it's grounded but it's grounded in the actual behavior okay so let's we'll put that aside for a second now here here's the sacrificial story so human beings have made sacrifices it seems to be a standard practice all around the world and in the biblical narratives they would often sacrifice something of value like a like a valuable animal well, like a child start the start well with... <laughs> well look, no, 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 look look i'm not so here's where the discussion is going to get into infant sacrifice um or i guess inf I, you'll see where harris takes this but i don't understand i mean i understand so jordan peterson's talking about sacrifice as something that it also might have been learned through adaptation because it's not because it can be beneficial to the species again i mean but none of this has anything to do with establishing i think what peterson's going to try to argue is that even if we have an evolutionary biology account of the rise of things like self-sacrifice it can still be it can be a fact that gives us value but the value will never be grounded in anything beyond the here and the now and so the values still never escape their social constructivist uh box do you see why that is because if you because peterson's not going to ground it in god he's going to ground it in something generic amorphous kantian noumena or something like that that we can't know or ever get to but is somehow this this archetypal experience right because he's very Super Jungian, he says in the personality course lectures that I've read everything Jung wrote. I've read it all. Well, I've read everything Jung, all the, the, even the papers you've never read. I've read them all. Which is interesting because I, I wonder if that means he's read the Red Book. 
which is Jung's like super esoteric Gnostic uh, alchemy uh, thing, which he, I haven't heard him mention that. I, I have heard him mention Aeon, which says that Jesus is Antichrist and Antichrist is Jesus. So we're, we're literal like Charles Manson level stuff there. I'm God and the devil. Yip, 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 yip. I mean, that's literally what Manson taught, right? So, <clears throat> so I think that that's the thing is that when you try to go the Jungian route, and there are a lot of fascinating elements to Jung's archetypes and all that, sure. But the problem is that the Jungian approach, since it departs from the ideas of an omnipotent personal God and creator God, this world in Jung is, you know, kind of an emanation that's a Gnostic sort of banished from the divine, from the transcendent. So in this world, we're trapped. It's a, it's a kind of a prison, standard type Gnostic type stuff, right? And so you're never going to be able to ground it in the transcendent because this world is seen to be cut off from the true divine, from the true transcendent. Oh, except that the true divine is a spark within you, right? So it's all this Gnostic gibberish, uh, which undermines the possibility of giving an account for knowledge. And that's why Peterson's psychological psychotheology approach will never actually do the work of what he's trying to make it do. So he's similar to what I do with transcendental arguments, right? When you hear a lot of the, you hear Jordan Peterson constantly talk about presuppositions, right? And you'll hear him talk about these categories. He's talking about the stuff I talk about. But the problem is that he's not doing the transcendental argument for God. He's using transcendental arguments in a sort of Kantian sense, which locates and smushes everything reductivist in a reductivist way into the human mind. But the human mind is finite, so he can't do the work of grounding that Peterson needs it to do. But he doesn't really care about those questions because he knows that 99% of the audience doesn't understand transcendental arguments and will never grasp it and isn't interested in anyway. They just want to hear cool stories about... Uh, empty guns being traded by city bugmen to Tony Soprano for a million dollars. Not making light of this. I know that human sacrifice was a part of this. Yeah, but, but, but that's, again, so just to... Just to so again, wh where do they get... I, the Abraham story? I don't, I don't understand where they think that human sacrifice... I think Sam Harris will refer to it in terms of Christ. The sacrifice of Christ. I'm not positive, but... Uh, because they don't exactly say what they're referring to. So I don't know if they're referring to Abraham and Isaac uh, or if they were talking about Christ on the cross and this Western conception of like Jesus is a human sacrifice to placate the wrath of the Father, all this nonsense. Crib on where my mind goes here. Yep. Human, human sacrifice is as old a religious precept as we know about. Yes. It's a cultural universal the, the other sacrifices are derivations from it. Circumcision yes. is a surrogate for the far more bar barbaric act of human sacrifice. And, you know, it, it answers every test you would, would put, put to, to it with respect, respect to it. He, circumcision is a stand-in for human sacrifice. <laughs> I've never heard of this. No idea where he gets this. Um, it was a serious incision and damage that's done to signify the transmission of original guilt i'm excuse me, original sin ancestral sin uh, not original guilt that's the calvinist view but uh, in the old testament it was only done to the male obviously and then that's replaced by baptism so baptism is the replacement of circumcision if you read colossians paul's epistle to colossians chapters one and two you'll see the significance of baptism replacing the rite of circumcision, which had to do with the transmission of the seed due to the fall. So it's true that when you divorce these biblical stories from the totality context of the totality of the covenants, right? From the covenant with Adam, covenant with Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and then Christ. A lot of these stories don't make sense. But if you understand it holistically, which none of these people ever do, it does make perfect sense because it's a, first of all, it was a test of Abraham's faith, if that's what they're even talking about, to tell Abraham to be willing to give up his son. Now, God never had the intention of actually killing his son, but it was a test to see if Abraham would follow God 
even if God said what appeared to be irrational and what appeared to be contradictory to what he had previously said. And so the fact that it appears to be contradictory already shows that God doesn't, the biblical God does not require human sacrifice. First of all, as the Byzantine synods say, which we just covered in a recent live stream, if God is the perfect creator, he doesn't need anything. What could a creature give to him? He has all things already. So this shows that God is not vindictive or doesn't have a, a, a desire to exact blood because he's a bloodthirsty demon god or something, right? That's a, that's a typical kind of Protestant, kind of Latin, even late Middle Ages view. Really, it develops out of Anselm into, into Calvin, basically. So, and we already seen multiple times in debates with the Calvinists that that's not that's not so that's a it's a weird sort of uh, Protestant view that these guys have that, and you see a lot of atheists make this complaint, right? Like, well, why does uh, God have to commit human sacrifice to placate His own wrath? So God sacrifices God to placate God, uh, and it's based on. I mean, so, yeah, that's all a pagan kind of view. So I can understand why they think this. But of course, it's just not simply, it's just simply not the orthodox view. So orthodoxy has a very unique take, uh, which I think does genuinely uh, exclude a lot of the criticisms that atheists make of the notion of Christ's sacrifice, right? Anyway, so let's move on to see where they're going with this. Archetypal significance, it's, 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 it's compelling... Uh, presence in the stories, stories across, across all cultures. cultures but Wait a minute, it has an archetypal significance? So does he believe in archetypes? How does a materialist, atheist, determinist believe in archetypes? So uh, a lot of these people will appeal to stuff that is not consistent with their position. And of course, that's a lot of times what we're pointing out with TAG. The horror is that it actually has taken place in all these cultures based on yes. explicit beliefs in the presence of just, just right. Well, uh, Arthur oppressive Kessler, scientific ignorance. Arthur right? so Kessler you, used that as the, an argument for the essential insanity of humanity. Right? We have, so, no, but it's not just the insanity of humanity. It's the, the misapprehension of the causal structure of the cosmos. You don't uh, know what that, controls okay. the weather. Well, you don't know why people get sick. You think your neighbor is capable of... Okay, so Harris is saying that the only reason that people would do these things is because they lack scientific knowledge. Um, no, but the... The purpose of the sacrifice of Isaac was typology. And, of course, atheists never understand typology. They, they always focus on the literal meaning of the text and not the typological significance of the literal passages. So the, the typology is that uh, Isaac is a type of Christ, right? So Isaac is a, 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 an intended human sacrifice, uh, at least from Abraham's vantage point, he thinks it's human sacrifice. And then, of course, Jesus, who is the angel of the Lord, shows up and says, don't do this. And that's because Jesus is going to be the ultimate sacrifice, right? But Jesus is not like, this is another Nestorian idea, right? That Jesus is the human subject, this, this guy from Nazareth, right? Who submitted to God so per perfectly that he ended up becoming this perfect human sacrifice. And that's what, again, a lot of people think the religion is, when it's not that at all. The second person of the Godhead took on human nature. He's not a human subject. He's only a divine subject. He possesses a fully human nature, but he's not a dual subject, not a human subject. That's the purpose of the condemnation of Nestorius. So there's not a human subject that's undergoing damnation or rejection of God. That's all just Calvinist stuff. The second person, God is healing human nature by that action, right? Because death is the enemy. Death is unnatural. And so death is being undone. But you couldn't have any of that if you don't have the doctrine of the fall. But none of these people believe in the doctrine of the fall. And they can't talk about the doctrine of the fall because that would mean that Genesis is true. And if Genesis is true, this will call into question all of their atheist assumptions and their Darwinian assumptions. And that's why Peterson's archetypal approach is never going to solve anything or get anywhere because it is also still stuck within the mundane. It's still within uh, the created realm and it's never going to be grounded in the uncreated because he doesn't believe, he, he won't admit the transcendent because that would be metaphysics and theology and he doesn't want to go there. 
casting magic spells on you, you're ignorant of everything, and you're trying to force some order on things. And yeah. so when you don't, in the absence of engineers, and you don't know why build, certain buildings fall down, you actually can agree with your neighbor that maybe you should bury your firstborn child into every post hole of this new building, which in fact is, it took place. Uh, but again, uh, <clears throat> very clear throughout the Old Testament, and this is something that's uh, unique to the ancient world, is that biblical religion, mosaic religion, begins this very important idea of man being made in the image of God, and you can't just do human sacrifice. Because humans have uh, rights, they have dignity, because they're made in the image of God, not because of societal, social construct reasons. It's a, it's a transcendent law. It's a natural law grounded in the, in the divine, not in human psychology. And so that's something very unique in the ancient world that Mosaic law brought, which was to even slaves in the ancient world began to have rights. You couldn't just do whatever you wanted to. <clears throat> that's unique because the other sort of brutality views of the pagan world did believe in human sacrifice. They did believe in sacrificing to, uh, you know, initiate the cornerstone of a building. In the ancient world, they would typically sacrifice a human being spill the blood on the cornerstone to to build a new city or whatever. Um, and that's forbidden multiple times throughout Mosaic law. And again, the story of Isaac is not a pro, it's an actually, an, it's a treatise itself against human sacrifice because the God of the Bible is not a God that requires human sacrifice. That's why the, the death of Christ is not a human sacrifice. It's a divine person stepping into the mode of being human to heal human nature. And that's the purpose of the death on the cross, which did not, it was not taken from him. He willed to undergo that death. That's why Orthodox theology always stresses he willed to undergo death. <clears throat> he wasn't, he didn't have it, uh, he wasn't robbed of his life against his will. And it's the consequence of ignorance. And so that, the problem is, if you're only going to talk about this you know, purified notion strange, of sacrifice. It's a very strange consequence of ignorance. Um, like, well, you it's, said, a, it's, it, it's the notion that we're in relationship to invisible others that can, that, that can mistreat us based on our are. not having offered enough. We're, we are. We're in, when but we're, not, we're but in not precisely those others. Well, but we're in relationship to the invisible others. This is an important point that at the end of the Two Dogmas of Empiricism paper that Quine makes, which is that when he talks about invisible made up others, invisible persons, guess what? He has the exact same problem every time he appeals to the true or the good. Because as <clears throat> Quine argues, the true and the good and all other types of predicates in a materialist worldview have the exact same status as the God Greek gods. <laughs> so Again, they just, it's like, I don't know if you saw the debate I did with Dawson. I mean, it's like the same situation where it's like, are you not hearing the, the things you're saying? It's like all the stuff that's being said by you is contrary to the stuff that you just said. You don't see, you don't see that, right? If, if God doesn't exist because we don't believe in immaterial, invisible, invariant, abstract things, then the true, the good... Laws of logic, abstract math, uh, mathematical categories and entities, meaningful predication, propositions, those also go out the window, don't you see? No, 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 I want to keep those things. Let me have those, just not the God part. Well, that's not being consistent, right? Because if all reality is material, then you can't have the proposition all reality is material, right? Because the proposition all reality is pure matter is a universal claim with a universal quantifier all, which is unjustified by your finite empiricist worldview. It's very simple. It's not, it's not hard to get this. You don't have the ability. You can say that all day long, but it's an assertion that's unjustified. Remember the Matt Delahunty debate? What did Matt keep saying? The laws of logic just are. I don't have to justify them. They just are. But remember he had earlier said in a separate debate, do not believe in anything that isn't empirically verified because that's just assertions and arbitrary. Oh, like you just did, Matt. Exactly. Will judge us in the future. 
Okay, so, but that, so again, let, you're, change, you're changing the noun in important well, I, ways. I know, but I'm also trying to understand, and I, I'm not trying to argue against the horror of child sacrifice. No, I, I, I would never imagine I, I you know, would. I know, I know, but I'm also trying well, to... I'm trying but to, my work would be much easier if you I'm, did that. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, the work of Um... How do we even get on child sacrifice? It's like they just went with child sacrifice as a given. And, I mean, does Jordan Peterson have... I mean, I thought he does Genesis, Exodus lectures. Like, does he not know that the Bible forbids human sacrifice? Like, why didn't he speak up and say, Well, no, actually it doesn't. No, no, there's no sacrifice in the Bible. No. <laughs> so... Right, that would be that would even be worse than enforced monogamy, hypothetically. <laughs> no doubt. Yes. No. So, okay, so see, I'm let's say that I'm trying to give the devil his due, and I'm trying to understand from an evolutionary perspective, like a cognitive behavioral evolutionary perspective, let's say, why that particular set of ideas would emerge, and in many in many places, perhaps autonomously, or once having emerged, would spread like wildfire. It's like mm. because I'm not willing to only attribute it to ignorance now. We could attribute it to ignorance, no problem, man. But but there's more going on there because it is a human universal. And like there's all sorts of things that happen in nature as a con It is a human universal. So you notice what he did there was now that he I think he knows we're gonna have to appeal to universals. Um, and I detect from his psychology lectures, he's had enough of a smattering of philosophy to get some of these points. Because he knows at least, uh, I mean, he's influenced by Kant, so he at least knows some of the basic Kantian ideas. Uh, and for him, right, that was a key phrase there, human universals. So we're not interested in the medieval question of universals anymore. It's a question of human universals. What's a human universal? Oh, well, that's just something that human societies universally have adapted or have constructed. Yeah, but... If they're human social constructs, then they can also go away. They cannot be the case. And so they wouldn't therefore be universals. Or they wouldn't be universals in the true sense, right? But so he's kind of playing a double game by appealing to human universals to avoid the question of the status of universals. Because if you admit the stat the real status of universals, then now you're in the domain of metaphysics and you're back to things like, you know, medieval Christian Byzantine discussions and disputes consequences of biological and evolutionary processes that don't work out well for our current s state of, of moral intuition, let's Agreed. say. Yes. Okay, so one of the things, because I've been thinking about this sacrificial motif for a very long time, and trying to figure out what the, what, what the hell is the idea? Also, by the way, how could you determine via empirical data that it actually is a human universal even, right? I mean, that's not even justified. I mean, do you really have access to all of the cultures to know that all of the cultures had either human sacrifice or had the notion of sacrifice? I mean, maybe they did, but just saying that it's a human universal doesn't make it so. Especially if you're trying to do this from an empirical scientist standpoint. Empiricism can never justify universal claims by the nature of being finite and empirical. idea here exactly and so so here, here's one way of thinking about it um, if you give up something of value now you can gain something of more value in the future okay so let's think about that idea for a minute so the first thing is that's a that's a hell of an idea yeah, that's well, delay, the, of delay, gratification. Yeah, delay gratification that's yeah. right that's the discovery of the future as well and so you might say, well, Whoa, mind blown. it's exactly the same thing as the discovery of the future. If we give up something we really value now, we can make a pact with the structure of existence itself such that better things will happen to us in the future. Now, yes. okay, now what's weird about this, and it's hard to understand, is that it works. So when I talk to my students, for example, and I say, what did your parents sacrifice to send you? I don't know why that's hard to understand that it works. It seems pretty common sense. So, like, man, they're on that story in a second, right? They know all sorts of things that their parents sacrificed. And they're delaying gratification in the present for a radically delayed return in the future. Oh, wow. Now, you think it's amazing. Animals, generally speaking, 
They might act out the idea of delayed gratification as a consequence of running out their instincts, but they don't conceptualize it. It's not obvious that animals give up something they value right now in order to thrive in the future. There's an old story about how to catch a monkey, right? So yeah. you put a jar up with rocks in it, and you put little candies, and it's a narrow neck jar. You put little candies on top of the rocks. And more stories. In front of the, of the jar. He's talking about how you catch a Matt Dillahunty, <laughs> right? That's how you catch a Dilla monkey. You put a bunch of candy in a jar outside, and you'll you'll find a Matt Dilla hunty out there feeding at the trough the next morning if you if you're lucky. Then the monkey comes along and picks up the candies, puts his hand in the jar, grabs the candies, and can't get it out. Yeah, I well, still they, don't know if this actually works on monkeys or if it's just a great story. Well, but, I, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. And yeah. I've heard I've heard I've heard various claims, but but oh, these they're loving their stories today. This is a. <laughs> the, the atheist's psychotheology story hour with these two. And uh, Jordan Peterson passed up a great opportunity for a Matt Dillon monkey joke there, which I did not pass up, by the way. Um, but the point is you can go pick up the monkey. He won't let go of the candies. Now, perhaps he would. You can't pick up a Matt Dillon monkey, though, because, I mean, you got to be pretty buff. You're going to try to pick up a Matt Dillon mon monkey. You know what I mean? What y'all think? Y'all think you could, you think, how many, how many Matt Dillon monkeys could you lift? If you can bench press a Matt Dilla monkey, uh, I'm impressed. You might as well enter the strongman competitions. The issue is, is that it's not obvious that animals will forego an immediate gratification for a future gratification. I don't, now, I don't, think, I don't think that's right, actually. And I actually want to hold... Well, the other. question is, can, will they do it consciously? Ah. They might act it out. They act it out. That's not the it's, issue. It's very hard. So again, notice the the level of sophistication that we are tortured with is we're having to argue whether monkeys consciously store up bananas and candies for future delayed gratification. And the audience's mind was blown that uh, Jordan Peterson talked about the concept of delayed gratification. One day, the Geico caveman was over there, you know, uh, playing with his jibby jabbies and he figured out that his jibbly wobbles, he figured out that if he stored up a bunch of bananas in the corner, he wouldn't have to go hunting the bananas that day. And which would then give him more time to play with his jibbly wobblies. You see what I'm saying? The delayed gratification allows for more monkey time. Monkey have value. I have value because monkey have value. The famous Matt Dillahunty argument. Hard to know if it's conscious because they won't I respond know. to the questionnaires. But I know, I know, and, it, and, and obviously after we observed that people who were capable of delaying gratification, sacrificed things that they valued in order to obtain a future goal, and it worked. That I have value because monkey sacrificed banana value. To act it out. And so, so the story what is the monkey? What is the monkey value money to property sacrifice ratio? What's that algorithm? What's the monkey to banana value algorithm? Somebody help me out. Put that. Can you put the algorithm in the code? Put like X equal five and then put a banana emoji equal Matt Dillon monkey times three to the square root of Jordan Peterson plus Brett Weinstein's goatee minus 33 Sam Harris. Uh, what does Sam Harris have? I can't think of what. Minus Sam Harris metrosexual man boots equals what value quadrant equation uh, algorithm. Put that into the chat. There it goes. Three banana equal Y. That's a simpler version of what I'm trying to say. That's pretty good. Yes. But I gave the full algorithm right there. Strange variance. But, but there's a reason for that too as far as I can say. So imagine this. Imagine that there's a rule of thumb. Sacrificing what you find valuable now will ensure certain benefits in the future well then the question becomes yeah thank you for spending five minutes explaining delayed gratification and future value <laughs> i mean maybe for this audience they need 
uh, simple concepts like define five times for them. I don't know, but uh, yeah, this does not sound like the brightest audience. I mean, they're like sort of it's like an audience of monkeys. They're like uh, cheer, they're cheering and laughing and hooting and hollering at everything they're supposed to like trained monkeys, I guess. So, how good could those future benefits be? And so that might be heavenly, let's say, in the archetypal extreme. And what's the ultimate sacrifice that you have to perform? And then I would say, well, the child sacrifice fits into that category. And so, wait, what? So now child sacrifice is okay because it's like the ultimate sacrifice? I mean, what? This is the most ridiculous. This is starting to become the most ridiculous debate we've seen so far. I mean, the Mad Dilla Monkey. Peterson argument was probably the funniest and the stupidest, but this one's getting, I mean, this, we're all over the place. I mean, we're, we're basically, I feel like, I feel like Kubrick's monolith and I'm watching the monkeys in front of me with Peterson and Brett and, and Sam over here hooting and hollering and the audience hoo, 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 cheering and laughing and giggling, hooting. Push to the radical extreme, and you could say, well, that's a pathological extreme. It's like, well, it is. It is a pathological extreme. But, but I think we also have to understand that some of the things that we've learned as we've evolved towards our current state of, of wisdom, such as it is, is that they were learned in a very bloody and catastrophic way. They were learned in, with incredible difficulty. And delay of gratification was certainly one of those, because it's a hell of a thing to learn when you're in conditions of privation. Okay, yeah, well, I think that the issue here for me is that you don't need... Yes, thank you, Luca. Uh, Luca has a good algorithm there, right? Monkey to the second quadrant times four divided by X, Y, Z raised to the 10th power of y2x square yx square bananas plus pi equals monkey to human sacrifice ratio value exactly All right that's a that's an even simpler version than the full version that i gave that included sam harris's metrosexual man boots because that has value too right and monkey have value banana have value we got to figure out the correct value quadrants here so thank you guys for helping um by the way, thank you for the super chats. If you want to support the show, please do so via the Streamlabs function. We're having, <clears throat> we're having a. I feel like I'm at the zoo today. <clears throat> I mean, do we have to stay over here in the stinky ass monkey cage? Can we go see the prairie dogs? Can we go see something cute? Can we go see the chinchillas? Do we have to stay over here in the stank ass monkey cage? What is up? <clears throat> I feel like the atheists, the atheists, they over focus on monkeys. What about, can we go to over to the aquarium? Cause we're always in the freaking zoo, right? If you're having a conversation with the atheist, you're in the mental zoo. That's the only place this, this whole debate is the mental zoo. Can we move over to the aquarium? Can we go see, uh, Gomek or Maximo in the reptile garden? You know what I mean? Why we got to stick over here? In the, the monkey hut, which stinks, by the way. This debate stinks. It stinks. What's that from? Quiz question. We got an obscure reference. What's this from? It stinks. If you if you get that quiz question right in the chat, you will, uh, what will I give you? I will shout your name out uh, and give you some monkey, uh, some monkey, ooze what, what do you call what does a monkey do the monkey goes woo, woo, woo. i'll give you some woo, woo, woos, right what's that from quiz question nothing to do with the debate just an obscure reference it's not from the critic a conception of you, you don't need any kind of positive gloss on human sacrifice as a meme or as an archetype in order to form a coherent picture of the future that can motivate you so Okay, <clears throat> so this is equivocating on human sacrifice. Number one, human sacrifice to deities is wrong and demonic. 
if we mean self-sacrifice to save the lives of others, then that does give meaning. So I'm, I'm mystified that nobody made this distinction between a human sacrifice to, to the gods, to the devils, which by the way, even secular scholarship admits was pretty universal. <clears throat> Jamie, uh, I've not read this book, but Jamie read it and did an analysis of it by an academic human sacrifice in history and today. But Nigel Davies, Nigel, anybody named Nigel, you know, that's a British dude. There's nobody, nobody in America's named Nigel. Nigel, Nigel, when he grows up, he's got to write books about human sacrifice, he will. Right, nobody in America named Nigel. That's a Brit boy name. Anyway, but that book admits, that's a secular scholar admitting that biblical religion brought the ancient world's first anti-human sacrifice polemic and ethic. So, and nobody thought to distinguish between sacrificing your children to the demons versus self-sacrifice out of love. I mean, delay, delay gratification is fully separable from a notion that it might ever be rational or good to sacrifice. Oh, shout out. You got it. Synaxis podcast. Got it. That's, <clears throat> that's Joel's joke from pod people. When he does the song, <clears throat> uh, when he does the pod people song and he goes, it stinks. Exactly. Good job. Synaxis podcast. I'm proud of you. Child as an offering to an invisible other that doesn't but How do you know it's separable? Because that's the developmental history. Bees on pie. Burn a rubber tires. Right? I hope this doesn't get me. <clears throat> Hear the engines roar now. Mm, 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 mm. Idiot control now. Mm, 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 mm. Wheels on fire. Burning rubber tires. Mm, do, 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 do. <clears throat> Now I want to hear it. Yes. <clears throat> Let's do it again. You come in late, girls, again, you're out. All right? All right, from the top. With a pickle mind, we kick the nipple beers. And over trout. Ghetto down the highway at the speed of light. All I want to feel now is the wind in my eyes Stack of monkeys in my pocket My sister's ready to go Hear the engines roll now Hear the engines roll now Hear the engines roll now, now. Nanny on the road now Burning rubber tires Anyway Good. What do you think? It's six. Sack of monkeys in, sack of Dilla monkeys in my pocket. Matthew's ready to go. Idiot control now. Idiot debate now. Dilla monkey in my pocket. Peterson's ready to go. Idiot debate now. Mm -mm -mm. Historically separable, but let, let's just say it's not. Let's just say it's a matter of our origins. They're united. They're of a piece. It's just, it is the genetic balance. Yeah. Mystery of Science Theater is not Boomer. Nothing to do with Boomers there. ...to care about that origin. I mean, there are, to, to say that the... That is the only path forward toward a notion of the future, given where we've come from, or that it's somehow necessary to, to venerate now, or that it's good well, that we, we do took that venerate, path. But we do venerate the idea of sacrifice now. But I would say that but what's I would happened say, is I would that say we do it to, to the detriment of our moral intuitions in the religious context. So, for instance, I think that the, the notion that Christian, I mean, Christianity is actually a cult of human sacrifice. Christianity is not a religion that repudiates human sacrifice. Christianity is a religion that says, actually, no, 
human sacrifice is necessary, and there was only one that, in fact, was necessary and effective, and that's the sacrifice of mm. Jesus. And I think that is, when you dig into the details, uh, not only... Yeah, again, <clears throat> it's not a human sacrifice, exactly, which we've already covered multiple times. You know what? <clears throat> I Rift Tracks has not explicitly mentioned or acknowledged me, but they've made a lot of jokes and comments that I subtly think that they've seen my stuff. I'm not positive, though. But Jamie and I have heard enough Rift Tracks jokes that I'm like, uh... That sounds like Mike and Bill might have been listening to some of my stuff. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, I, I have sent some messages to some of the writers. Uh, and then they didn't respond, but, you know, who knows? But, anyway. A morally uninteresting vision of our circumstance and how we are, how we can be redeemed it's morally abhorrent, okay. right? So I think there's, a, there's better versions okay, so online. Let, let me so, okay, let me ask you a question about that. So um, in, 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 in the moral landscape, you lay out this pathway. There's the bad life and there's the good life, right? And, and you, right. you described what they were and the bad life is a variation of hellish circumstances. I'm doing my, I'm doing my, uh, my tape. He's always sitting like this. Is that, and correct me if I'm wrong. The conception is that the proper pathway forward so that would be the moral endeavor, is to move away from the bad and towards the good. Yeah, insofar as we understand which way is up, yes. yes. We, 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 the, 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 the basic claim is that we can be right or wrong with respect to, to true, our true, beliefs. True, true, true. We, we don't necessarily know how to do that in an unerring manner, and, yeah. and we could subject that to approximation correction along the way, and we should, but we can outline the broad scheme, yeah. which is progress away from hell towards something that's positive. Uh, what? <laughs> exactly. No, we can't. What's the basis for any of that? Uh-oh, did you notice what they did? And by the way, I'm noticing. This is why we're going to start doing tag with this. We're going to use this little simple chart for the uneducated, for the masses, for the atheists out there, for the suits. We're going to have this simple chart. How many times have we heard in this discussion appeals to the true versus the false, the good versus better. Well, quite a bit. And, and Peterson's going into it right now. So I credit him for going to this, but no justification for these claims. By the way, guys, reminder, in one hour, I will be over on Lord Voldemort's show talking to a few million people. So be sure to head on over there. Wake up. Get up. Get up, you monkeys. Get up, you bonobos. Woo -hoo -hoo. Get on over to Alex's. You know what I'm saying? Put your bananas down. Dilla monkeys. Put your bananas down. We got to go over to Alex's in one hour. But right now we're having fun. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I would say that there's an implicit claim in that that you should sacrifice everything in you that isn't serving that to that. And I would say that that's essentially the same claim that's made in Christianity. Well, again, that is a... I mean, I understand the... Uh, okay, I'll kind of give some... I'll give, I'll give Peterson a little bit of credit right here. I wish he had said that there's a difference between human sacrifice and self-sacrifice. I mean, that's two different things. And we're conflating these things, first of all. Uh, but... Anyway... I'll give him credit for, he's kind of in an indirect way raising this question. So he gets a, a point for that. Impulse to up-level these barbaric, ignorance-derived beliefs, right, to something that is morally, that is interesting and palatable in, in, in the current context. And I, I, I understand you can... Trying to up-level? Was he talking about upgrade? <laughs> what, what is up-leveling? Level up? What's up level? Yo, y'all got that new iPhone. I went there with my pimp upgrade and got that new iPhone. He's trying to up level. Yo, y'all got them, uh, yo, minutes rolling over. Y'all got them minutes to roll over. You need to up level your plan. <laughs> what is up leveling? Uh, by the way, up leveling, that's appealing to this. 
value judgments, which, and he, didn't he say in the first part, I seem to remember that he said something in the first part that we know that existence, if it's miserable, is just hell. And so that might be why Peterson is saying we want to get past uh, living in hell to, to a better situation. Value judgments. Okay. So so how, how do we up-level uh, Sam? Do that. My concern there is you can do that with everything. I mean, you could do it with witchcraft. Why not do the exact same thing you're doing with religion to the history of witchcraft. Witchcraft is as 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 well. Well, modern described. witches would do that. So so that's a perfectly valid. Right, but, but it, yeah, but so it's but it's a that should be of concern. I mean, there, there... Wait, modern witches would do what? <laughs> what did he say? Sure, there is you can do that with everything. I mean, you could do it with witchcraft. Why not? I can up level with witchcraft. Well, I guess it depends on what grade, what what level witchcraft is you. Now we're talking about role-playing games. I'm straight up in Skyrim over here. We got into Morrowind. We were in Final Fantasy levels now where we're trying to upgrade. We're trying to up-level with witchcraft. What? This is getting ridiculous. Do the exact same thing you're doing with religion. Are you a 32nd level winch mage? Girl, you need to up-level. <laughs> Witchcraft is as, as, as well, modern witches would do that, so, so that's perfectly right. <laughs> modern witches would up-level? <laughs> I mean, how, what? It's just time to quit, man. I mean, it's just time to give up. This is what is the, the public intellectual discourse. They're talking about up-leveling like we're playing Dungeons and Dragons over here to get a better life. But it's, yeah, but so it's but it's a, that should be of concern. The, the reasons why we don't look, want to endorse look, modern absolutely. witchcraft, right? Look, absolutely. And so, so you know, one but, of your but I mean, I'm not talking and modern witchcraft currently exists. I mean, you go to Africa, they're they're you know people are hunting albinos for their body parts because they believe in sympathetic magic, and, yes. and, ki and kids get killed as witches. So this belief endures in certain pockets of humanity, and we're right to. I mean, I just think at, at a certain point, you have to acknowledge that some ideas are not only wrong, but their, their effects are disastrous or have been disastrous or will likely be, even if good in certain circumstances, will likely be disastrous in the future. And then we shouldn't be hostage to these, these ancient memes. We shouldn't have to figure out how to make the most of the worst idea that anyone's ever had, which is you should, maybe you should sacrifice your firstborn child. To a be, a being so, you've never so, so again, biblical religion does not teach that you sacrifice your firstborn children to God. <laughs> like, what is he talking about? I mean, I'm just... Uh, there, there is no one, no Christian body that exists, so-called Christian body, believes or has ever taught that you sacrifice your firstborn to to God. By the way, the story in Judges is not about human sacrifice either. Uh, James Jordan has a good <clears throat> chapter in his Judges book on the story of... Uh, is it Jephthah? Is it his daughter? The, the rash vow that he makes is uh, very similar to the way that uh, Eli is dedicated as a child to the temple, right? And so there were, there were children could be dedicated to the temple service in the Old Testament. So the, the vow of sacrificing does not always necessitate a literal human sacrifice, right? Just in the same way as that a virgin in, in, in our day, right? You can become a monastic. That's a form of human sacrifice, right? doesn't mean you're literally chopped up on an altar. This is ridiculous. But anyway, they, they don't know any of that. But See, hold yeah. on, Sam. I, I want to hold your feet to the fire here okay. a little bit. Um, two points. One, interesting observation. When you presented the example, so on your podcast I had argued uh, 
that uh, believing that porcupines can throw their quills might protect you from a porcupine that might wheel around even though porcupines can't throw their quills. Your uh, listener sent the better example, which was all guns are loaded. When you presented it, you didn't say all guns are loaded. Well, you said it, treat all guns as if they are loaded, which is, I yeah. think, the same reflex that you have faced with any metaphorical truth, which is that it can always be unpacked. But, it, but actually, that's the way Jordan talks about believing in God as well. Right. Well, that is true. Uh, Jordan talks about believing in God as a metaphor, as if God exists. Ignoring the question of whether whether <laughs> whether he actually exists. I mean, how are people are so dumb as to fall for this as a good argument? I'm sorry, it's just this is a really stupid argument. And I'm not saying Jordan Peterson is stupid. I think he's a very intelligent man. But as an argument, this is just so bad. And I would have to even give credit to the atheist for saying that. So you want me to accept that the metaphorical idea of God is going to help me and I can live as if God exists and totally forget the question of whether God exists. I mean, this is just like bizarre like this is this is a terrible argument but that's where you're forced if you don't want to talk about metaphysics and that's what jordan peter that's why jordan peterson is basically forced into this pragmatic psycho theology argument that god is this concept which will help you be a better version of you right and it's it's god as a technology exactly as we we described and so I actually give a point to uh, Sam Harris right here because this is a terrible argument. And actually, so, so this is, but then if we take something like, uh, you, so you say, uh, all right, sacrifice of children is abhorrent. Let's say it is. And then you say, I mean, we can think of all the kinds of ways to refute this uh, to show it's a bad argument. Like, so I'm only basically accepting a, an abstract idea of a deity to help me live better or to give values. But if I'm going to do that, I could pick any kind of abstracted deity I want that already conforms with my presuppositions about what I think is better. Maybe I, for, let's say I am a uh, theistic Satanist. Is it, maybe it, it helps me live better because I have order, I have rituals. And yeah, I mean, I'm not invoking Jesus, but I believe in one God. It just happens to be Satan, and it's a very empowering, self-empowering faith. Uh, I'm I'm able to worship myself. I'm able to do what I want. I have structure in my life such that I can get all the stuff, all the me, me the gimmies and the me's that I want. I deserve an escalade, right? So, according to Jordan Peterson's definition or argument here, you could you could insert any kind of deity in that you want. And I guess that's where he was going with the witchcraft example, right? Like, well, I mean, if it's just a matter of inserting whatever deity I want to help me live better according to some self-help abstract, right? And that's, by the way, that's exactly what Tate says about God too, right? God is the highest version of yourself that makes you better, some bullshit he says. I mean, I can't believe people think these are actually good arguments. I mean, it's just mind-boggling to me. It should be so obvious that this is these are just ridiculous arguments, but I get people people are idiots and they think these are good arguments, I guess. I don't know what else to say. Well, Christianity hasn't uh, foregone the sacrifice of children. In fact, it's described one child who is sacrificed for everybody else. But... Arguably yeah, but it's not human sacrifice. Truth that frees those who are adhering to this tradition from ever considering sacrificing a child. And what sure. it does is it uh, provides a motivational structure that may in fact have very positive outgrowths, though not literal, the idea that someone would have sacrificed their own child uh, for the benefit of everybody else mm. not to have to. That idea might... Um, engender a, a, a large amount of good work that would sure. result, as Jordan is pointing well, out. Well, let, let me just concede that the hardest case for me, I mean, which, which I did up top, just in defining... defining. Yeah, but doesn't Sam Harris believe in uh, abortion? <laughs> I mean, so, like, does he really not believe in human sacrifice? Or that 
sacrificing your firstborn child is the worst imaginable act, like he said earlier. Oh, but wait a minute, you believe in, uh, you're a supporter of uh, pro-choice. So, again, you don't really believe that. You're just arbitrarily choosing which things you argue for and believe, depending upon the moment. Uh, when, after you define metaphorical truth, and I use the gun example, there's certainly cases where the useful fiction is more useful than the truth. I would, I would grant that, but you know, I think those cases are few and far between, but handling guns is one of them. It's just not useful when the, when the casino opens across the street and you can place a million dollar bet, right? Then you want, you want to have some purchase on the literal truth. So you want to be able to, and, and again, this is psychologically interesting because, uh, and I keep com coming back to the gun example because the one that, that is viscerally real to me, like if, if I have a real- I still don't understand this example. That I know to be unloaded. I still emotionally can't treat it as a harmless object. I can't point it at my child just for the fun of it because, you know, that we're going to play cops and robbers now with a real gun, right? This, this, I, have a, I have a superstitious attachment to always being safe with the gun, right? And it's, and it's important. It's important that that get ingrained and yet it is not strictly, ra it's, it's, it's not irrational because it has good effects, but it's, it's not actually in register with what I know to be true factually in each moment. Right, so, okay. so it's so very here, low cost. Here, here. Yeah, it's very it's, low it's, cost. It's very low cost. It's not yep. dividing societies and, and yep. causing yep. people to go to war. And yep. if you were gonna teach a child gun safety, you would want to encode this so that they yes. would automatically know never to behave as if a gun is unloaded because that's what gets you into trouble. Yeah, as, as an, an adult, adult every, every, every gun... And how does this relate to religion? I'm still not understanding the, like, What's the what's the correlation here? Religion is the gun, the bullet, unloaded. I, what's the metaphor? What's the literal thing? I don't get it. An owner recognizes the distinction between the metaphorical truth and the literal truth here. But I guess what I suspect is going on here is that your <clears throat> mechanism for dealing with the world involves unpacking all of these things, and I think it's highly productive, but it also means that you have a hard time understanding why anybody would do anything different, and that's the question, is just because we can track fully the difference between guns actually all being loaded and behaving as if all guns are loaded, right, that one there's no leftover, there's nothing, there's no mystery there, right, mm -hmm. but there may be many of these things for which there is some difficulty lining up the metaphorical truth with the literal truth and operating... What is this metaphor? I don't understand it. ...might have advantages, which I think is what you're okay. getting at. So, well, so here's, here's another uh, situation, because... You know, we have to remember what kind of catastrophic past we emerged from and how much privation ruled the world prior to 1895, essentially. And mm -hmm. certainly the farther back you go, the more bloody and horrible it was. I mean, how often do you think it was necessary? And this is not obviously something I'm in favor of. And this is also one of these situations where we get to play with ideas that we might not otherwise play with. How often do you think it was necessary for people in the past who had absolutely no access to birth control and who didn't have enough food to sacrifice a child for the survival of their family? I mean, okay, God only well, knows, you yeah, know, and, yeah. and that's, well, but that's worth thinking about. It's like, you know, life is unbelievably cruel and difficult. And one of the problems that comes when you discover the future is that you might have to make the most painful of sacrifices. And lots of, lots of archaic people do this so, sort of thing. They do that with their elders. So now we're talking about a live territory, right? Remember when they when the soccer team crashes and they got to eat each other? <laughs> like, but I mean, how often does this actually happen? I mean, okay, we have a couple stories in the Bible where people were, you know, Israel was walled up and they ended up cooking the youth. Um, but I mean, this is not a common thing, but even still but what, what? So the sacrifice of the youth for second breakfast. I mean, I just don't understand what, where, what is the? This is the. This is the. Maybe they're all drunk. Did they just drink before this meeting and come up with just a bunch of crazy stories? That beforehand they were like, look, this this tonight. Let's just get wacky with it. Let's just get freaking out there, dude. Let's just tell some crazy stories. Let's use some crazy analogies of guns and 
mobsters giving million dollars for empty gun gangs at, at the casino. I mean, I'm just, I don't know what's going on. They do that with sick people. They do that with infants that they deem too fragile to survive. Like, so part of child sacrifice, and I know the literature on child sacrifice reasonably well, part of child sacrifice seemed to emerge out of the um, observable necessity to leave someone behind so that everyone else didn't die. And we don't know how often that had to happen in the mm. past. It might have had to happen a lot. Right. Now, obviously... Yeah. Although, uh, just, just yeah. in, in the interest of kind of conceptual clarity here, yeah. human sacrifice is a larger horror than that. So you have what was very common is the sacrificing of, uh, you know, captives. So you take the Aztec sacrifices oh, yes. where you, you know, you now have slaves, some of whom you're going yeah, to... Yeah, the Aztecs sacrificed yeah. about yeah. 25,000 people a year. Yeah. So, yeah, look, I, I mean, so. it's, it's clearly a bloody mess. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, one of the things that you see... Happening well, it's clearly a bloody mess. You've got bodies all over the place. You've got to hire 25,000 Aztec janitors to come in and mop it all up. Bucko, clean up your human goo, bucko. Clean up the temple, bucko. <laughs> Extraordinarily interesting is that you see echoes of child sacrifice at the beginning, but what happens is the sacrificial notion gets increasingly psychologized as the story progresses. So, you know, you see that transition with um, Abraham and Isaac, yeah. where, the, where the, sac the child sacrifice is actually forbidden, although previously demanded by God. And then you also uh, see... What? Not true. Total bullshit. So he was almost finally making a good point there that the purpose of the Genesis Abraham story and Isaac is to forbid it. But he said that although God had previously required it, what are you talking about? God didn't require human sacrifice. <laughs> what? Total malarkey. What are you talking about? And this whole debate has been premised on Assuming that God did require human sacrifice. No, he did it. Where are they, where are they getting this from? Pretty laid out in the substitution of the circumcision for the idea of sacrifice itself. And then what seems to happen... See, I'm trying to figure out how these ideas develop psychologically from their behavioral underpinnings. Is that eventually... Well, that's what I'm saying. Why is this dude lecturing on Genesis and Exodus and millions of people are watching this and he doesn't even know the basics? Like, what is he, what is he talking about? I mean, just to, to lecture on these things, being completely ignorant of, I mean, I get, okay, so, you know, if you don't believe in Christianity, I understand you might still want to do a literary um, analysis or, uh, you know, reading of the Bible. If you take a, if you go, if you go to college, you'll have like literary reading of the Bible courses or whatever. I understand why people do that in academia, but I would still want to know, you know, the theology behind it, right? And whether Jewish or Christian, I would at least want to know what they thought about the passages, not just my psychotheology reading of the Bible. I mean, it'd be like, imagine me going and debating the Muslims and not caring what the Muslims think about the Quran. It's just, I read the Quran and it's like my personal feelings about it, right? I mean, nobody would buy that. It's not a good argument. It's not a good approach to do that. So again, I just no idea where he's getting these ideas. We can, we can conceptualize a sacrifice in the abstract so my parents can sacrifice to send me to university without anything or anyone having to die. It transforms itself from something that's enacted out as a dramatic ritual into something that's a psychological reality. But all that blood and catastrophe along the way is part of the process by which the idea comes to emerge. Right. It doesn't... But, so what is the connection of all of this? Because, yes, so there, there is this history, and I would argue we are busily trying to outgrow much of it, if not most of it, whether it's evolutionary history or just we the, might the be cultural history. We might history. be trying to transmute it so that it becomes, we, we, can, we can maintain, as you, you suggested we do, we can maintain what's useful in the tradition and throw out everything that's pathological. Yes, as, but we're, we're constantly discovering a, a lack of fit between both our, what we perceive in ourselves as biological yep. imperatives and the cultural legacies of just what mommy and daddy taught me was true, right? Which yes. we have now every reason to believe might not be true. And we're trying to optimize our thoughts and institutions and, and relationships with one another for our current circumstance. And yet we have this legacy effect of mm -hmm. certain books and certain ways of, of speaking have a completely different status. And they have this status because 
they may in fact, it, it's imagined, not be the products of merely previous human minds, but they may be the products of omniscience. And that, this is where the respect accorded to religious tradition is totally unlike the respect we would accord to anything else, you know, mythology, right. literature, past science, past philosophy. I mean, you know, people can read Plato and Aristotle uh, for their entire lives with ever, without ever being fully captured by the kind of dogmatism that, that every religion demands. Uh, no, not true. Uh, have you ever heard of the Soviets and the communists and the Marxists and their readings of Plato? <laughs> so, I mean, Plato is the first communist. The Republic, all socialist republics are derived from Plato. And Plato's ideas of uh, infanticide and population regiment and population control really undergird the entire modern history of eugenics, which is not uh, is not only confined to the uh, tiny mustache man followers in fact Fabian socialists also have uh, wholesale adopted the exact same policies just in a different form than what tiny mustache man adopted so you understand that uh, what he's talking about is just completely totally false the the readers of Plato and Aristotle are the origins of modern population control total nonsense be captured yeah, I would, by I would, really I would going to be in here I would say that's, that's actually, actually an archetypal, archetypal truth, truth. You know, the idea that the pathological tradition stands in the way of updating. That's an archetypal truth. I mean, one of the reasons why in, in creation myths, one of the variants of creation myths, is that the hero has to slay a tyrannical giant in order to make, him, make the world out of his pieces. And it's a metaphorical restatement of the idea that a tr tradition can become hidebound, and when it becomes hidebound and too rigid, that it interferes with kind of adaptation. But the problem is, and, and this is, I think, this is something we really need to hash out. The problem is, the problem that you're describing is the problem of a priori structure. Now, some of that's textual, but some of it isn't textual. Some of it resides in us as our psyche, insofar as we have the problem. So, <clears throat> when Jordan Peterson talks about a priori structure, he's talking about Kantian categories and presuppositions, the stuff that you hear me always referring to. That's what he's referring to. But you heard him just say that they're mental structures, right? Let's hear that again to be clear exactly what he said. The idea that a tr tradition can become hidebound, and when it becomes hidebound and too rigid, that it interferes with current adaptation. But the problem is, and, and this is, I think, this is something we really need to hash out. The problem is, the problem that you're describing is the problem of a priori structure. Now, some of that's textual, but some of it isn't textual. Some of it resides in us as our psyche. In so, far as so, Kantian. You see that? That's the Kantian move. The categories that were previously Aristotelian categories, things like telos, purpose, causation, things like, um, you know, the self, uh, space and time. I mean, all these different types of a priori categories. Uh, I know that Aristotle's categories are more specific, like location, place, motion, um, you know, how, how, that, how one thing quantity and all that but you can expand that into other categories like what we're talking about Kant's categories and so forth like the self and you notice that Peterson just restricted them to psychological so they're not metaphysical categories they're psychological but this undermines his whole argument and his whole position by restricting them to psychological the problem I'm, I'm describing here is that because he knows that he can get further avoiding metaphysics but it's not it's just a it's a, like a bait and switch game of like oh well i'll just speak the language of the world via psychology and pretend that i'm not doing metaphysics when i'm trying to sneak in metaphysics but people there are people out there like myself who can see through this and say look you're not avoiding metaphysics you're actually avoiding the very uh, question that sam harris needs to have challenged his materialist presuppositions in metaphysics. And you're never going to adequately refute somebody like Sam Harris or anybody else in the atheist sphere until you begin to challenge their presuppositions about their use of metaphysics as they deny metaphysics. But you, Dr. Peterson, also deny or avoid metaphysics, and so your argument will never get anywhere. We have two categories of... 
it will never get anywhere in an actual argumental, argumentative way. I'm talking about formal argumentation there. You might convince a lot of people through sort of bait and switch like natural theology does, but the, is our goal to be uh, effective at convincing people or is our goal to be making good arguments? Of books, in this case. Right? We have those written by people like ourselves, just endlessly open for criticism and, and conjecture, and those written by invisible, omniscient okay. but, entities. But I would and, presume that if these religious systems weren't codified in books, if they were still just enacted or, or dramatized, you'd have the same objection. It's not the fact that they're in books that's relevant. Well, no, but it, it is the dogmatism. It's the fact that right. we, can't, we can't jettison the okay. bad parts. Okay, it's the dogmatism. Okay, so to me, that's the, the same as the problem of structure. Now, here... So again, I mean, does he not realize that dogmatism is inescapable for any position? Because he has a dogmatic position about scientism that he's not willing to have his presuppositions questioned. So this is really just a feature of all human worldviews. It's not some unique feature to religion that his position somehow avoids. Um, let's read a couple of super chats because uh, we're going to have to hop on over to do Lord Voldemort pretty soon. Squidward Tennis Balls, $2. Thank you for the stream. It's one of my favorite styles that you do. Do you have any thoughts on Andrew's debate with Matt Dillahunty coming up? Um, I don't. I don't know what topic they're debating. I mean, I'm. I mean, I mean. Sometimes Matt debates other topics like secular ethics or something. So <clears throat> I'm not sure what topic they're debating. Whether it's just theism or ethics or what. But uh, I mean, I think Matt. I think people are really beginning to. I think gradually see through the kind of terrible. I, I saw an atheist commenting the other day on one of my debates talking about Matt basically saying that, look, Matt's pretty much like T-dump level now. He's like the worst of the atheists. So I think even the atheists are kind of getting tired of Matt. Uh, so hopefully Andrew does well. M Mr. Slowboy, $5. Review the Cy Bruggenkate Matt Delonte debate. It's very precept heavy. I don't really like uh, Cy Bruggenkate. So I think he's kind of, he makes precept look bad. So probably won't review that. Ribranium, $5. Hey, Jay, here's some pay piggy coin for the meanest man on the internet. Oh, so mean. So mean. You notice that uh, Redeem Zoomer got mad when I didn't, I wasn't mean to him, didn't do anything. This is like, this is, I think it's just becoming this thing that people are starting to see through that people say, oh, he's so mean. And I don't have to debate or interact with him because he's mean. I wasn't mean to him. I wasn't mean to Dale, that other Protestant. And they just use this as a way to say, oh, well, uh, I might not have done well in that discussion, but he's mean, and so I'm still a better person. It's just the l weakest, lamest way to go about stuff. But I do appreciate the Redeemed Zoomer apologized for coming after me personally when I didn't do anything to him personally. Um, but, you know, that's the way it goes. So uh, Germ, $10, doesn't say anything. So thank you so much, Germ. Appreciate it. By the way, guys, remember, you can subscribe to my website and get access to all of the archives in the show description going back almost 10 years. We've got a lot, a lot of lectures and talks that you can get access to. Morden Solas, $3. Thank you so much. And that's he set up a monthly tip. Appreciate that. You, you, you know you can if you want to, guys. Also set up monthly tips. Uh, much appreciated. Benjamin, $5. Love your stuff. Um, or missed your reaction to the Lord Voldemort uh, Nick debate. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't have a reaction. So I heard half of it. So I've not heard the whole discussion. I'll have to hear the rest of it. Demo Chakarov, $5. Thank you for everything. Benjamin, $5. Jay on uh, Lord Voldemort, awesome. I want to know your take on the debate. Yeah, well, again, I've only seen the first half of it. So I'll have to hear the rest of it and let you know what I think. Stefan, one six nine ten dollars you're, both, you're right about focusing on ethics and truth for TAG. Malpass in a recent debate tried to feel, appeal to uh, unaliving babies for it is just morally wrong in everyone's view. Yeah, exactly. That would just be arbitrary. Um, because there are cults that do unalive babies. Uh, Benjamin, $5. Is there anything worse than Sam Harris riding his four horsemen in the 2000s to gain credibility? Jordan Peterson is bad, but Sam Harrison, look, Sam Harris looks like a lunatic now. Yeah, I think a lot of people, just like Dillahunty uh, and these people that were that wowed people so much in the, uh, you know, late 2000s, early 2010s, people are kind of seeing through that. And they're like, actually, these people are hacks and their arguments are really low tier. 
So that's one positive sign is that people are starting to move beyond a lot of this stuff. Um, but I feel like, and I'm not trying, you know, one thing that, that's annoying is that, you know, if you're somebody at my level or status where you've got, you know, over a hundred thousand on YouTube, which is not huge, a mid, mid size channel, it, it is kind of frustrating to hear a lot of these really low tier arguments for 10 years straight. And I've tried to interject the next level of argumentation going past this, this low tier stuff. And it just sort of feels like at a, at a certain point, like, I mean, it's just the public is never going to get beyond this low level stuff. That, and, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. A lot of dumbing down from the system, a lot of the establishment, you know, d d attacking people, toxifying them, making them, you know, making them dumb. But there's also a willfulness on the part of the public to be dumb. So there's a, there's a multiple factors here. Um, and it does look like these people are starting to lose some of their credibility, which I think is a good thing. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, if I criticize these people, it's like, Oh, you're jealous. You're an ankle biter. And I've tried to not be that way. Like, uh, no, I just literally think that the argument is either good or bad. Uh, I'm not trying to leech off of any of these people's followers or whatever. Um, I, I'm, I'm, com I'm comfortable enough in my approach, my argumentation that I don't really care anymore if people, um, I guess I'm resigned to the fact that we're just not going to ever reach a large amount of people. I don't think, and that's okay. I don't mind that. I'm happy with where I'm at. So, um, you know, if we don't ever get a million followers, that's okay because I don't know. I just need to up level. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm trying to up level. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm trying to up level. Here's the, here's the problem, I think, with the way that your argument is laid out. And I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. Yeah, I, I just, like you said, I haven't recovered from monkey have value, right? I mean, how do we how do we deal with that level, right? I mean, that's that pretty much ended my career, I would say. Matt Dullhunty, monkey have value. I mean, that, that's, that's top-tier atheism right there. That's, that's the next level, bro. All right, looks like we got a few more minutes. Uh, I'll do a little bit more. I want to remind you guys, too, that we do have a show sponsor, which is Chalk.com. Head on over to Chalk.com and make use of the promo code J50 to get 50% off all of those excellent Chalk products that you see right there. Chalk is the uh, best source for online supplementation. If you're looking for pure, better than organic level, uh, they're, I mean, they're super stringent and spurgy about their purity levels, especially when we're talking about things like the Tonk Adali, which is shown to boost testosterone. You got the Daily, which makes up for mineral deficiencies in our Western diet. You got Ashwagandha. I mean, it's all over there, especially for a great price this male vitality stack you get 50 percent off that when you use the promo code j50 that's jy50 chalk is our uh uh super awesome bays red pill sponsor we love chalk.com and uh people are like oh so i said do you even lift bro yes in fact um chalk has helped me get in the mode of regularly going to the gym and, and lifting i'm not joking now that we are in a place where i'm right by a gym uh, we're doing it right. I mean, I'm not I'm not at coattail levels yet of basketball arms, but hey, we're getting there. We're getting there, right? We're building. We're working, right? We got we got some we got some nice man cleavage right here. Look at that. Oh, boo yeah. Look at that. People lusting in the audience. Stop lusting right now. I command it. But I want you. I command you to go over to chalk.com right now. And use that promo code J50, that's JY50, to get 50% off all those awesome products. And it's not just for the ladies. There's also female vitality. Ladies need vitality. You know that? Do you know a lady needs vitality? Do you know a lady could get that vitality right there? At Chalk.com, use the promo code J50, JY50. Also, recurring subscriptions, you get a little more off. JAY53 Life, J53 Life, JAY53 LIFE. Gets you 53% off all recurring subscriptions over at Chalk.com. We love Chalk. That's our official sponsor. And of course, Chalk has the upcoming new product about to come out. It's going to start delivering in a few days. Talking about that Chad Mo dog. Look at that. Chad meme. Chad Mo right there. I'm looking forward to this pre-workout. 
And now that I'm going to the gym, yes. Do you even go to the gym? Do you even go to the gym? Do you even go? Yes. Yes. Mr. Slowboy, one dollar. This is the last comment, comment on this. Side Tim Bruggen Kate. Bad argument. And Dal Dillahunty's even worse arguments would be funny for you to analyze. Maybe. You said, I think Cy came out on top. However, he does give Precep a bad look. Uh, I'll check it out. I found another debate that might be fun to do, which I'd never seen before. I think in order to do this, you kind of got to cover the big name people. Uh, because otherwise, you don't get, don't get many views. But this one looks like it might be okay. Uh, it has 300,000 views. Uh, Michael Shermer versus Frank Turek. Uh, I'm guessing he's some kind of evangelical pastor, so probably not the best arguments there. <laughs> I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe he's really good at debate. I don't know. But this one might be fun to review. We could take a look at this one and see if it if it looks like it's uh, worth doing. Um, I don't know that we've, we... I think we did one of these debate reviews that had Michael Shermer doing something. But it, he didn't have a significant role. He was just throwing in some weird comments. But Roger, $3.00. What do you think is the top argument against an impersonal God? The top argument against? The top argument against an imp a personal God. No, against an impersonal God. I'm sorry. Uh, I think the easiest one would be that the universe would then lack intentionality and telos. So if the universe lacks intentionality by God and, and thus it lacks telos or purpose, then we have a disteleological universe, and in a disteleological universe, you lose the ability to have true and good, false and bad value claims and metaphysics claims. Benjamin, $5. Jay, you're becoming James Franco from Spring Break. Are you talking about when he's trying to play Riff Raff? Because of my hair? I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe if I, well, I do, I do have, do I have a rap song? I got a little bit of a rap song. Okay. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Okay. All right. If you would hit like and share, head on over to uh, Lord Voldemort's because we'll be live on Lord Voldemort's here in a little bit. Uh, I don't know for, there's not a whole lot more in this, uh, in this debate. I mean, it's kind of weak. Um, but guys, remember head on over to uh, my channel. Head on over to Rockfin as well and subscribe, not just to me, but also to Richard Grove at Grand Theft World. Guys, remember, you can go to my website and get my books, signed copies in the shop. All of the books at my website are signed copies. However, do remember that we will be in Italy, so book orders will be a little bit slower. So if you put in your orders in the last few days, or if you put in your book order for the next few days, I won't be able to ship out the books. I do all that myself. It's all my own business. So be patient. You don't have to email me. You forgot my book order, dude. I'm going to beat your ass. No, you don't have to do that. I didn't forget it. Just be patient. <clears throat> it's going to take a little while. Also, one of the books is back ordered. So it'll be a little bit longer for that one to get here. But I promise you, you're going to get your books. Nobody's lost their, their orders or their books. You're going to get it. I promise. <clears throat> it's just sometimes because I run all my own stuff. If I'm gone, if I'm out of town the book order is a little bit slow because I can't mail 30 books out when I'm in Italy. You know what I mean? Uh, all right. So be sure and support the show though, by going and getting the books. Also, Jamie's books are in the shop. Be sure and support Jamie. Jamie's uh tallow cream that she makes really good stuff in the shop. Uh, you can get my books, Jamie's books, signed copies. Um, Lord Voldemort. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Band DOT video, that kind of stuff, right? So we'll be live over there in uh, about 15 minutes. See you guys. By the way, tonight we'll be live with Bayes Lit Analyzer. So Jamie and I will also be over on BLA's channel, right? He's talking about Spring Breakers. I know. Yeah, Riff Raff. James Franco. <clears throat> we'll be over on uh, <clears throat> BLA's channel tonight doing four horror movies that were food themed. Uh, one of them was really gross. About, I couldn't watch it. It was grossing me out. So we'll be talking about that over on Bayslet Analyzer. That uh, is shared in the community tab. Guys, always check my community tab if you want like updates on stuff. So everybody have a good day.